Hi everyone, my name is Kelvin Friske and I am the Climate to Business Project Manager with Nolwenn Brossier and Vincent Martin, Project Officers. We are pleased to welcome you to this expert hearing. Climate to Business is led by the Chief Project. Its purpose is to help transforming higher education in management so that all students get trained in ecological issues. Our main partners is Audencia, EM Normandie, ESCP, MBS, and TBS Education are the other business schools partner of the project. Le campus de la transition, CNP Assurance, le CGDD, the Finance Climate Consortium, and Carbon for Finance are also supporting the project. This expert hearing takes place to benefit all the higher education community. It is also meant to feed the reflection of a task force helping us identify core knowledge and skills related to ecological issues that every management graduate should have. This task force that composes the hearing panel is made of the teachers Anne Audranly, Aline Ox, and Daniel Evans, the students Clarissa Amourou and Adria Poisson, the alumni Emmanuel Charrier and Florent Mourier, and uh, Sophie Saudret and Erika Logé-Cherel from the Audencia Learning and Quality Department. This being said, I'm pleased to welcome Gaël Giraud, economist, director of the Georgetown Environmental Justice Program, research director at the CNRS and former chief economist at the IFD. He will share his perspective on the economic paradigms for business schools in the context of ecological issues. The presentation will, will last approximately one hour and will be followed by an hour discussion and uh, it will be recorded. During the presentation, Vincian will paste in the chat a link to a Google Doc where you can register to be kept informed on the next auditions and receive the link to the video. Gael, thank you for agreeing to participate. The floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you for inviting me. So I'm going to share my screen with you. I hope it works. <clears throat> yeah, seems to work. So I guess you see my screen now. <clears throat> so yeah, I'm sorry. The, the, the slides are in French because I had forgotten that I was supposed to speak in English. I hope it's not a problem. <clears throat> so I will translate everything, of course. Um, so um, maybe to begin with, I will start with just uh, reminding a couple of facts that I think everybody should, should be aware of and that certainly should be taught in every business school courses or curriculum. Um, let me start with a, a, a nice work that we are doing now here at the Georgetown Environmental Justice Program, which is based on the very simple following idea. I, I'm sure you all made this experience that if you try to, uh, to run, let's say, in the savannah in the south of Chad, um, it's way easier than to try to do the same thing, to do your jogging in the morning, uh, let's say in the jungle in Vietnam, even though the temperature in, in Chad is much higher, but it's much less humid. So what makes it unbearable in Vietnam is that it's both hot and humid. So here you have a clinical uh, fact, which is that there is a threshold in the combination of temperature. So here it's average daily temperature and relative uh, humidity here. Above this threshold, this is a little for any human body, a normal human body, which is exposed to this more than six hours without having any access to air conditioning. So the question raised then is, um, where will be the places on earth where people will be exposed to these kind of little combinations of heat and humidity? And we have run a number of simulations uh, here at Georgetown. And this is one answer. Um, at the end of this century, if we keep following the so-called SSP 4.5 or RCP 4.5, which is currently the most pessimistic scenario of IPCC. Um, so as you see here, if you are, let's say dark brown or, or very dark red, then it means that essentially you will have, you will be exposed to little combinations of heat and humidity every day during the year. Um, if you are yellow like this, it means one day over three. So here, is, as you see, the entire Amazon basin will be completely uninhabitable, um, a large part of Central America. Um, certain pieces of the Guinea Gulf will be very hard to survive. Um, also, you know, the, um, the Arabic Peninsula here, and essentially a big part of India, and of course, almost everything everywhere in Southeast Asia, especially in Indonesia here with the Java Island. So, but so which means uh, if you believe in this kind of map that there will be huge migrations. 
Um, and I think this is certainly a topic that every student in a business school should be aware of, which is the main topic in the following decades will be migrations, climate refugees, forced displacement of people who cannot survive in these kind of areas. And it's clear that people are not going to die peacefully. They are just going to try to migrate. The question is where? So in Latin America, it's kind of obvious. They will all probably try to go to North, but what about Africa? Would they try to go to Europe? What about Southeast Asia? For instance, Indonesia, you know, Indonesia, it's um, um, the most populous uh, uh, Islamic nation in the world today. And the question is, where are they going to go to migrate? Are they going to migrate to Australia? One might be skeptical about whether Australia will be very hospitable in the coming decades. They might try to go to the backyard of China, like Vietnam, Malaysia, etc. And so this, this becomes also a geopolitical question. But everyone who wants to do business in the coming decades should just be aware of that and be aware of the fact that there will be huge migrations. Interestingly enough, also, you see that the southeastern coast of the US here is yellow, which means one day of three people over there will be exposed to little combinations of heat and humidity, and they will not be able to rely on, on air conditioning to save themselves. Why? Because as you know, air conditioning is part of the problem and certainly not, certainly not part of the solution. Um, a report has been published in 2019 by, published both by NASA and the Secretary of Defense in the US, asking the question, what might prevent the US Army from implementing its missions in the 2020 decade? And the answer is two, twofold. First, pandemics, and this was published before the coronavirus pandemic. And second, uh, power blackouts due to the overuse of air conditioning. And we already saw this last year, there were big uh, power blackouts in California and in Texas, partially due to the overuse of, of air conditioning. So there will also be migrations in the US, inside the US, probably to the north. And if you look at China, it's even worse. So people in, 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 in the entire coast, eastern coast of China, will be exposed at least one day over three. And here, it might be even one day over two. Uh, in the southern part of the eastern coast of China, which means also gigantic migrations inside China. In other words, billions of people are probably going to move in the coming decades, and this will be part of the daily life of everybody, at least in the second half of this century. Um, another point is that we speak a lot about climate change, and I guess nowadays everybody is aware of the fact that global warming is a serious threat, uh, but this is just one aspect of the problem. Another aspect is the lack of drinkable water, because as you probably know, the cycle, the water cycle is already uh, perturbed by climate change. So I do believe that every curriculum in a business school should also include something about water, because water is coming, fresh water is coming, is becoming probably one of the most important and, and scarce resources in the coming decades. So this is a map that has been done by WRI, w, uh, World Resources Institute, which is a big think tank in the US, in Washington, and it's in 2040. So just the day after tomorrow. So the color is easy. If it's dark red, uh, it means that you may lose up to 80% of the current access to drinkable water. If it's red between 40 and 80, and if it's orange between 20 and 40. So nowadays you see that Europe is concerned. Europe was not concerned here. Why? Because Europe is not humid enough. But here we may have a lack of drinkable water in Spain, Portugal, Italy, obviously, but also in France between 20 and 40 percent. And of course, there are many, many countries now, of course, the north of Africa, the southern part of Africa, again, Indonesia, here you see China, India, huge countries, and the US will be exposed also to this kind of threat. Um, uh, so the, what is the solution? The solution is um, desalinization of, of uh, seawater. So Morocco is already um, programming a number of plants of desalinization. Spain, Spain and Portugal are doing the same. I'm not aware of anything in Italy, that's weird. And I'm not aware of anything in France, even though France might also lose up to 20% of its access to drinkable water. And this is just now in 18 years. So we should really speed up in order to make sure that we won't have a tragedy around water in France in the coming decades. So I do believe, um, so every student should be made aware of that and also should understand that there is a link between water um, global warming, obviously, but also energy and minerals. Why energy? Because um, if you look at these two countries here, so Tunisia 
and Morocco. So they are exposed essentially to the same problem. So the growing scarcity of drinkable water and both want to rely on uh, desalinization plants. The main difference being that Morocco has invested for a long time in clean energy. So Morocco has today, for instance, the big uh, solar power plant in Wazazat, which has been partially funded by the French European Bank and the World Bank, um, while Tunisia doesn't have this. So Tunisia does have a bigger problem because Tunisia needs first to invest in, in energy in order to have enough energy, in order to uh, feed a plant, in order to desalinize uh, seawater. So you see, uh, in order to get access to water in the coming decades, you may need to have an access to energy. And energy, of course, must be green. Otherwise, you are just <clears throat> uh, uh, worsening the problem. So there is an interesting link between water and energy. And then the next point, of course, is minerals. So as you probably know, at least in the SHIFT project, it's clear um, minerals, a number of critical minerals are becoming very scarce. Probably the most critical of all being copper. So in a paper published with Olivier Vidal, we have shown that most probably uh, we are going to reach the peak of extraction of copper at the world level by 2060. Um, and here you have the curve of extraction of copper, zinc, and aluminum, which are all exponential curves starting shortly after the Second World War. And if you show this to any um, geophysicist, he or she will tell you, you know, it's just impossible to dream that we will keep increasing this way the quantity of copper, zinc, or aluminum that we are extracting from Earth. It's just impossible. First of all, of course, because the quantity of copper available on Earth is just finite. And also, before we reach the last kilogram of copper, it will be impossible to, to extract more copper. Why? Because in order to extract it, we need more and more energy and water. So now you see the link between minerals, energy, and water. In order to have water, you need energy. In order to have minerals, you need energy and water. Um, by the way, I think also a, um, a very important topic in our business school should be to teach our students that exponential growth is just impossible. Um, we are used now for a couple of decades to have everything growing at an exponential rate, like real GDP. Here you see uh, the world population, uh, urban population, et cetera, et cetera. And that's just impossible. We cannot keep going this way. So there is, a, there is an exponential curse in our lives. And it seems to me that's very important for our students to, to grasp this. Um, of course, linked with minerals, there is a big geopolitical challenge because as you know, minerals are not equally uh, spread on earth. So obviously there is one country which has access to a lot of minerals, it's China. But China also uh, launched the, the big, the grandiose project of the, the Silk Road Belt, uh, which is essentially a way to have access to matter in other countries. Um, just as a side remark, you know that uh, the, the Silk Belt Road goes through Ukraine. The link between uh, Moscow and Istanbul uh, goes through Ukraine, crosses Ukraine, and it's clear to me that China probably had the project with Russia just to have a peaceful and quiet Ukrainian country in order to be able to extract uh, minerals over there because Ukraine is also a huge reserve of minerals and obviously this is not going to happen. So, so our students should understand that exponential growth is just impossible, that minerals are getting scarce and that in order to have access to minerals, we need um, more energy and more water and that there are geopolitical challenges linked to that. What this means is that I do believe that the topic, which is now uh, uh, known in France as being linked to uh, Philippe Wicks, namely uh, the low tech, uh, you know, imaginary, the low tech industry is definitely the future. So we, what we should teach our students in a, in a business school is that they have, if they are fascinated by the iPhone, uh, they definitely have to change completely their mind to understand that what we need is certainly not more iPhones in our life, more digital, digitalization and that the technique will not save us, uh, but rather we need very simple manufactured products with no program of the obsolescence. So products which last long, products which are easy to repair and easy to recycle. And an iPhone is everything but easy to repair and easy to recycle. So we definitely need to change that and to, to invent a new type of low tech industry. Uh, the last point I want to mention as just a reminder is also the question of biomass and access to biomass. That is, 
uh, food and agriculture. So here you have a map which has been uh, drawn by a friend of mine, Mark Imhoff, working for NASA, which is the places where there is biomass production. And as you know, biomass is just the zero degree of, of biodiversity. It's just, you know, energy given by the, by the sun, which is captured uh, by the soil and transformed into, into carbon. Now, so obviously you see here the Congo, the Congo forest, the Amazon forest, and the uh, Southeastern uh, Asian forest. Now, here are the places where human beings consume biomass. And of course, it's a completely different uh, map where you see many people <clears throat> consume biomass in the Arabic Peninsula here, <clears throat> in India, especially in the north, in China, especially in the north, again in the Java Island, a little bit in Japan, and of course, a little bit in Europe and in the north of the US, which means that <clears throat> a number of populations have a deficit. So this is called the Human uh, Appropriation of Natural Primary Production, HNPP. Um, and here you see, um, oh, sorry, it was, it was the opposite. So this is the place where people consume it, sorry. And here, this is the place where you see the deficit. Um, so if you are black and red, this means that you have a huge deficit. If you are dark blue, it means it means you don't have any deficit. In other words, if you are black and red, this means you are consuming more biomass than the ecosystem in your neighborhood is producing. So it's essentially, as I said, here and in India, China, and, and Java Island. What does it mean? It means that these, the populations over there, in order to be able to survive, that is just to eat something, they rely on international value chains. They rely on international trade in order to have access to uh, food. Um, and I'm sure it's, it's obvious already that a number of countries will make the experience that this value chain can be very fr fr fragile, uh, especially due to the, to the war in Ukraine. So it's clear that we are going to have protests again in a number of Arab countries, let's say in Egypt, um, because they will, they will lack access to, to bread and wheat due to the war in Ukraine. So to be dependent upon international trades in food is certainly not a good idea in the coming decades. And this is probably also becoming going to become a problem. So I do believe that we have to make clear to our students that, you know, if they dream that um, international trade will just solve all our problems, it's definitely not true. And they have to understand that they will need to be very cautious if they want to enter into an international value chain. Um, so the next topic, of course, is uh, pandemics. So we know that um, global warming is going to increase the number of pandemics. So we are also working on this here at Georgetown. So this is the extension of malaria in 2050. Um, this is still a controversial issue, but probably malaria is going to extend to the north and to the south, thanks to thanks to global warming. So if malaria and malaria could jump to Europe as well. So um, so if this is true then this will also become a, you know, a big sanitary and security, national security problem for the US, for Europe, for Asia. So we definitely need to understand that and to be prepared to that. And it, it's obvious that we were not prepared to the coronavirus pandemic, so let's be prepared for the next one. Uh, <clears throat> also, of course, a, an obvious topic is the rise of the sea level. So here you have a number of maps. This is for 2040. So just the day after tomorrow. And so here it's, it's the sea. And here, that's the, the continent or here, the island. So that's Jakarta, you know, the former capital city of Indonesia, which is disappearing um, because of the rise of the sea level. And here you have a projections of the, the soil with, which, which will be underwater by 2040. Same story here for Bangkok. So Bangkok will be underwater partially at least by 2040. Same story here for Bangladesh, as you know, at least one third of the country will be underwater by 2040. So let me give you another example, which is Vietnam, where this is becoming a, a, a sec national security threat. So the entire uh, Mekong Delta will be underwater before 2050. Um, and this is the place where uh, Vietnamese people cultivate rice. So they do have a food security problem in one generation. And when I talk to them as a chief economist of the French Open Bank, they would tell me, you know, we don't know where to, to cultivate rice instead of, of in the Mekong Delta. And we have no clue about the economy, the macroeconomics of, of Vietnam in, in 25 years. So this is also certainly a topic that our students in a business school should be made aware of 
because this will certainly have a huge impact on, on the world economy. <clears throat> so to, to wrap up a little bit everything in this, in this direction, what we did at the French Revolution Bank, trying to understand what might be the big goals of a number of countries in the coming decades, we used the following map. So the interpretation of the map is easy. Um, let me get rid of that so that you can read it. So here, the x-axis is the Human Development Index, HDI, which as you know, probably is based on three pillars, three dimensions. First, the average income um, per capita. Second, the, a certain measure of the level of education. Uh, and third, a level, a, a measure of the, um, the health in the population. So you average all this, you put a number, which is, uh, you get a number, which is uh, between zero and one. And usually people believe that if it's above 0.8, which was the HDI of Russia a couple of years ago before the sanctions, then, then you are fine. So an HDI above 0.8 is considered as being fine. Now here, the Y axis is the ecological footprint which has been developed by a friend of, my, a friend of mine, Matthias Wackenagel, a Swiss engineer in California. So of course, as you know, probably know, the ecological footprint is not the best indicator of the entropic pressure on, on natural ecosystems, but it's, you know, it's one way to try to measure it. We could discuss it. I completely agree with your criticism against this, against this, uh, this measure, but you know, for lack of a better uh, index, let's use it. The point is that now, if you look at each point here, it's a country. So France is somewhere here. You see, um, Belgium is over there, Sweden, etc. So which means all the, the wealthy countries are here. In other words, they have a very high HDI above 0.8, sure. But they also have a very, very high ecological footprint. So what is the threshold for ecological footprint? Well, it's, well, you know, it's the line above which you are above the, the, the carrying capacity of, of the planet. So in, in uh, 1961, it was here, which means if in 1961, you were above this line, so well, <clears throat> well you needed more than one planet in order to, to sustain your living standards. Now today, or at, I think, yeah, in 2012, the line shrank to here. Why? Because meanwhile, we have destroyed a number of natural ecosystems. So the threshold, the carrying capacity of the world is going down and probably today it's, it's somewhere, somewhere here, it's even lower. So all these wealthy countries are above the line, which means they're not sustainable. By contrast, a number of very poor countries here, um, essentially most countries in Africa, for instance, Chad, etc. So they have a very, very low um, ecological footprint, which is fine. So they are below the, the world capacity or the carrying capacity of the planet, but at the same time, they have a very low HDI, which is bad. So the main question for everybody is to try to end up here in this magic rectangle where you would have an HDI above 0.8 and an ecological footprint below, below the carrying capacity of the planet. And as you see, this rectangle is just empty. <clears throat> so I think this is a, a nice way, you know, to convey the main ideas to our students, to tell them, you know, um, everybody has progress to make. It's not as if we could just dream that everybody would just follow the Californian way of life. It's just impossible because it's not sustainable. So wealthy countries have to go down here. They have to reduce their ecological footprint without reducing their HDI. And poor countries like this have to increase their HDI without increasing their ecological footprint. And I would say even there is a third dimension, which is not in this graph, obviously, which is linked to the fact that a couple of years ago, you had one country, which was exactly at this point on the edge of the rectangle. So its HDI was exactly 0.8 and its, uh, its uh, ecological footprint was exactly on the threshold uh, of the carrying capacity of the planet. So this country was Cuba. Nowadays, I believe that Cuba is here because of the trade with the US, but it was Cuba at this time. And of course, it's hard to believe that Cuba might be a model that you want to imitate and to, and to extend on the planet. Why? Because of human rights and democracy. So we should, we should rephrase what I said to saying, well, a goal for every country in the coming decades should be to end up here, while at the same time reinforcing human rights and democracy. And that's certainly something that we want to convey to our to our students in a business school, I believe. 
in order to prevent them from dreaming that, you know, human being has always been very smart and clever and we have always avoided big catastrophes. So we will, at the end of the day, we will find a solution to solve this problem. Uh, this is just not true. There is a, a terrifying book by Mike Davis, uh, an American historian, who discovered that in 1893, we had a big El Nino effect on the Pacific Ocean, which led to gigantic uh, droughts and floods, both in Brazil, in Africa, in India, and in China, which were all at this time colonial empires. And then the colonial administration back then did not pay attention to the problem, the result of which was more than 50 million people dead within a few years, according to Mike Davis. So we already had a catastrophe linked to climate change because we know that global warming is going to increase the number of El Nino effects and the, and the severity of these El Nino effects, El Nino and La Nina. Um, so we already had a tragedy linked to climate change. The main question for the coming decades, uh, especially for our students, is to find a way not to repeat this tragedy. <clears throat> um, and, and surely there is also another topic that uh, we should mention, even though I'm not going to enter into the details about this because it's very complicated from an economic viewpoint, which is biodiversity. So when I talked about Biomass here, as I told you, this was just you know the the, the first level, um, the ground floor of biodiversity. Now, if you want to enter more deeply into biodiversity, probably the first thing to tell to our students is that we are we are running the risk of having oceans with no fishes or no eatable fishes by 2050. Here you have the density of the northern part of the Atlantic Ocean at the beginning of the 20th century. Here you have the same. Uh, the same region at the beginning of this century. Um, and of course, the contrast is, is very sharp. So, so that's the main question. And if they want to do business with fishes, they have to understand that. So, and as you know, probably there are a number of other species which are uh, disappearing today. That's a big, big question for, for the next decades. And certainly, I think at least our students in the business school should understand that this is a problem. So um, there are a number of um, very, I mean, quite interesting, um, you know, instruments in order to help people uh, reflect on the question. And for instance, in my classes where I teach at Georgetown University, I use this, this movie, Don't Look Up, which is just fantastic. And I try to, uh, uh, what, what, I, what I'm doing with my students is that we play a serious game where <clears throat> some of the students are like uh, Jennifer Lawrence and Leonardo DiCaprio. And some others are like, you know, this guy who is playing Bezos, this guy who is the chief of staff of, um, of the president of the US, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we try to understand where the problem is. Why don't we move? Why is our society so blocked with the question of uh, the ecological transition? Uh, why have we made so little progress, even though IPCC is warning us in a very clear way for more than three decades now? So, and I believe that this should be the main topic of, of, I mean, the second topic of any lecture to our students in the business school. First topic, uh, the severity and the gravity of the situation. So we should at least remind them about all what I said here, you know, all this. And second topic, why aren't you understand where, you know, who is not moving forward, who doesn't want to, where is the conflict of interest, et cetera, et cetera, in order to understand how to go forward. So first, <coughs> probably in order to, to, to grasp, I mean, to, to convey to our students an idea of what could be relevant economics, um, I would certainly begin by saying and reminding our students there are a number of extreme events today, uh, natural disasters, which are costing a lot of money, especially to insurance companies. So this map has been drawn by, you know, the, the uh, insurer of interest uh, called Munich Re in Germany. Um, which, which maps a number of natural disasters and how much they cost. And, and um, by 2016, only 30% of these weather-related loss events were insured. And you probably know that the CEO of AXA a couple of years ago said, a, a, a world with plus four degrees of global warming cannot be insured. So the question would be then, what, what is our economy? if we don't have insurance companies or if our insurance companies are just bankrupt. So certainly I would start here and say, you know, everything you believe about a, a, a quiet and, and 
peaceful world where you will have an insurance company forever, this should just be put into question because it's not obvious that we will keep this world in the coming decades. Um, another point that I would stress also, it's, it might look like an anecdote, but it's not. So it, it happens that we are working at Georgetown on the question of Mayotte. So, you know, probably Mayotte is a very small, um, uh, small French archipelago. Um, you see it here <clears throat> near Madagascar, between Madagascar and the African continent here, Tanzania, uh, in the Indian Ocean. And Mayotte is exposed to a big volcano which emerged in the ocean 50 kilometers away from, from Mayotte. And as a consequence, Mayotte shrunk by 17 centimeters um, within one year, so that Mayotte now is exposed to typhoons, the rise of the sea level, big waves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we are study, studying this and trying to figure out how to help, sorry, people in Mayotte. And then what we discovered is that there are a number of optical fibers, uh, and there, there is actually an entire submarine system of optical fibers which go through Mayotte or near Mayotte. And it might be the case that if we have a big natural disaster here in the in the neighborhood then it might destroy this, this system. And then a number of people would be in trouble, including ourselves, because in Europe, we depend upon this. So this is a very, I mean, apparently simple example showing that natural disasters, which will be more frequent, frequent due to, the, um, to global warming, might induce huge losses through this kind of channel. Um, then, of course, I would ask the question, what is a good management in this, in this very complicated world that is going to emerge? And probably I think the Convention on, Bio on Biological Diversity um, is a good, good hint, you know? <clears throat> so I would help our students read this and understand what it means, for instance, when, when the convention says that the objectives of management of land, water, living resources, and we could add minerals, energy, et cetera, et cetera are a matter of societal choice. And this indeed, I believe is true. So our students have to understand that, that it's not just maximizing the profit of my company or maximizing the dividends of my shareholders, uh, because we also have to change the governance of our companies in order to adjust to this kind of social choice. And then second, um, I would certainly try to reflect with my students about what it means when the convention says management should be decentralized to the lowest appropriate level. Um, what does it mean to us? What does it, what does it mean for a manager of a company? Um, ecosystem managers should consider the effects of their activities and adjacent and other ecosystems. So that's you know the big question of, uh, could we have an ecological accounting system, which would quantify not just the, the monetary debt, but also the ecological debt, so there are a number of people working on this in France. Um, I'm sure you know them. Um, they work essentially at Dauphine University, but you also have a, a proposal that has been made a couple of years ago by the World Bank and, and other proposals that should be discussed. And certainly I would spend time with my students trying to understand how we could rewrite the accounting system of a company, a private company, in order to take into account the uh, possible impact of the activity of this company on, on adjacent ecosystems. Um, so I would also certainly speak about market distortions that adversely affect biological diversity. And this would be an opportunity to remind our beloved students that markets are everything but efficient. Um, so it, this is not, you know, this is not a crazy Marxist theory. This is the most orthodox neoclassical general equilibrium theory, which tells you this. Namely, um, if you have financial markets which are not complete, then they are deeply inefficient. And what does it mean for a financial market to be incomplete? Incomplete, it means that there is at least one risk and one investor on the market who cannot insure himself or herself against that risk, who cannot hedge this risk. Of course, this is obvious that there, there are such risks on earth everywhere uh, to begin with climate risk um, and therefore, financial markets are deeply incomplete and therefore, unfortunately, they are deeply in inefficient. So we should just forget the idea that financial markets will save us from the, the, the climate tragedy. It's not true. I mean, it seems to me they are rather a problem in the, in the picture than part of the solution. 
Um, so I don't have time to go into all this, but certainly, you know, it's very, it's very, very instructive to, to discuss this kind of convention, even though it might be far away from the, the worries and the nitty gritty of the daily life of a manager in a company, a private company. Probably I will also insist on this, uh, the, 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 you know, the instruction number 11, um, the ecosystem approach should consider all forms of relevant information, including scientific and indigenous and local knowledge, innovations and practices. Uh, there are a number of companies which are already doing this. Um, for instance, I, I, I run a survey in Nigeria for Total with uh, Cécile Renoir from the Campus de la Transition. Um, and we were trying to discuss with the local population in order to try to understand what was going on uh, with a number of utilities um, installed by Total. Um, and Total could not have this discussion with the people. And this was very unfortunate because had they had the, if they had had the possibility, the opportunity to have this discussion, they would have understood what the problem was and why, why they had so many leakages on their, on their utilities, et cetera, et cetera. So, but this goes even behind this. We know today that in order, to, let's say, to try to protect the Amazon forest, uh, we need to discuss with the indigenous population within the Amazon because they know how to protect the forest. We don't know how to do it. So for that purpose, it seems to me, I would certainly also include in the curriculum of our beloved students in a business school, something about anthropology. So this might be surprising to you, but I do believe that uh, we cannot have a sensible lecture on management and economics today without entering into anthropology. I remember we had this discussion with Paul Romer, you know, who, who got the Nobel Award in economics when he was the chief economist of the World Bank. So we organized an event, both the French Open Bank and the World Bank, and we were discussing a number of questions about governance. And Paul said back then at this time, I think it was in 2018, um, not, we cannot understand economics if we don't go into anthropology. And I think he was right. So here it's just a, you know, a very small uh, introduction, small, uh, small introduction into what has been done by uh, Philippe Descola, the, the famous French uh, anthropologist, saying, you know, we Westerners, we have one viewpoint about our relationships with nature, which is the naturalist viewpoint, which claims that we are unique, we as human beings, in so far we have an interiority. You could call it a soul, you could call it conscience, you could call it, you know, a spiritual dimension, whatever. And we believe that there is no such thing as interiority in nature. What we share with nature is just physicality. That is, if I, if I go to a tree, what I share with this tree is a number of atoms, but this, this tree doesn't have a conscience. At least this is what we believe as Westerners. And it seems to me it's very important for us to acknowledge that there are a number of human beings who don't agree, who completely disagree with that. And even naturalism for Europeans, it's, it's a new you know, uh, ontology, it's a new cosmological viewpoint about nature because during the middle age, Europeans were not naturalist. They were analogist. Analogist means that we are completely dissimilar both in interiority and in, in, in physicality. So I have nothing to do with the tree, both in terms of conscience and in terms of physics, but we are linked, I am linked to this tree thanks to analogical relationships. There is also, of course, the animist viewpoint, which says that um, uh, we are similar in interiority, so a tree may have a soul. And there is the totemist viewpoint, which says that there are subgroups of people and, and, and living bodies, uh, which are both similar in physicality and in interiority. For instance, if, I'm, if I belong to a certain tribe in the Amazon, I might be convinced that I have a totem, and this totem being, let's say, a puma or a jaguar. And if I kill this puma, then I will kill myself because we are kind of brothers, you know, even though we might know it, uh, we might not know it. So, so the important point here, the, be, the main takeaway is to try to convey to our students that the naturalist viewpoint, which probably they believe is the unique viewpoint on earth, is certainly not unique. And there are many other viewpoints. And if, if we want to understand how to talk to indigenous people, let's say in the Amazon, so that they can teach us how to keep the Amazon in order to save the planet, then we have to understand the viewpoints. We have to understand that they're definitely not naturalists, that probably most of them are animist and or totemist, and that we have just to try to understand this viewpoint, just to have a conversation with them. 
Um, otherwise, I would say certainly from a more scientific viewpoint, I mean, scientific in the sense of natural, quote unquote, natural sciences, we certainly also have to explain to our students that we have to rewrite entirely economics. This is also what I'm doing now with some of my PhD students and members of my research team here at Georgetown. That is my viewpoint is that economics should be understood as part of thermodynamics. You know, that's an old idea that goes back to George Scurragan saying, you know, an economy is just a big dissipative structure like a human metabolism. It's a big metabolism which extracts energy and matters which have been either stored on earth or produced by solar energy. That's biomass, for instance. The economic system metabolizes this like a human body and then produces some work like this conference. Now we are working with this conference. You're listening, I'm, I'm talking. And for that purpose, all of us are metabolizing both energy and matter, not just our human bodies, but also the laptop that I'm using now, et cetera, et cetera. And then we will exude some degraded energy. So an energy with a high entropy, degraded materials, materials with a high entropy. Hopefully we are going to learn how to recycle this, to recycle this matter here and to put it again in the stock of matter that we can use in order to metabolize it again like copper. And as you know, certainly the biosphere is emitting a low grade thermal energy to the cold universe. So a viewpoint like this one, which is completely new to a number of orthodox and classical economists, I believe will become the dominant viewpoint in the coming decades um, when we will be able to understand this and we are working on it. Um, I'm sure this will become the, the main viewpoint of everybody because it's so obvious that we have to understand this in order to be able to deal with the growing scarcity both of energy and matter. <clears throat> so which means that if we take seriously the idea which is not just a metaphor but the, the true scientific idea that an economy is just a dissipated structure that also has to be understood in terms of thermodynamics then we have to see that this is an out of equilibrium structure which is not at equilibrium a dissipative structure is never at equilibrium, otherwise it dies. This is based on, on a network of small dissipative structures, as you see here. So that's a big dissipative structure, which is based on a network of small dissipative structures, like this one, um, with emergent properties. So there are properties at the emergent level that you could not deduce from the micro level. So macroeconomics is definitely not just the aggregation of micro, properties. Um, a dissipated structure is hierarchically self-organized, so we, we definitely need to understand how this works, both in nature and in social organizations. Um, and it, 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 uh, it exhibits some complexity. So, so complex economics is, is a growing body of literature today, complexity economics, let's say, but it's far from being well understood and, and not let alone taught in our business schools. Um, so in this regard, I certainly would try to, uh, to provide a number of lectures uh, in, the, in a business school about macroeconomics. So the macroeconomics of complexity linked to climate change. So using the type of model we are working on. So we use this model for the report of the, the Stern Stiglitz Commission uh, of which I was a member. Um, so we could, we could show for instance in a, on a number of simulations what's going to happen if we implement a huge ta carbon tax, something like $300 per ton by 2030. Uh, if we do it, then according to the model we were running at this time back then, we could have some, still some growth. Of course, we did not take into account all what I said earlier, that is the growing scarcity of matter and energy. We were just supposing that we are just facing the climate change challenge here. But then what we showed is that if we refrain from implementing, let's say, a big carbon tax, then probably we're going to have a forced degrowth somewhere in the second half of the century. So degrowth not by, the, by wisdom, but by disaster. So I do believe we also have to teach our students that this is possible, that they have to understand that, you know, growth uh, and let alone exponential growth is just impossible, and that we have to manage a way to degrow in a number of sectors, probably not in every sector, but in a number of sectors, and this is a societal choice, in order to be able to keep a number of living standards that we want to keep. And that this will be a big discernment for the next generation. 
Um, and therefore, we have to expose our students to these kind of questions so that they think about it when they are young and still studying before they will enter into uh, their professional life. Um, so since time is running, I will also say a few words about inequality. Uh, it happens that the last report of IPCC, AR6, of the group two put a lot of emphasis on reducing inequality because the main argument being that um, as long as we have huge inequalities of income and capital and wealth, then it will become more and more complicated and difficult to implement uh, the ecological transition. Um, a very simple example in France is the movement of the yellow vest, um, which was clearly due to the fact that growing inequalities make it unacceptable for a number of people and for good reasons, just to pay more uh, for a carbon tax while uh, very wealthy people just evade uh, taxations. So here you have a, a very well-known chart uh, which goes back to 2016. So it's already a little bit obsolete today, but it's just worse, worse today. Um, this has been done by the Credit Suisse. Um, and so you have the, num the, 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 the quality of wealth that is owned by the top 1% of the population. So that's the wealth share of the top 1%. And as you see here in Russia, back then 2016, it was 60%. So 1% of the population, so the, the, the infamous Russian oligarchs, they own 60% of the wealth of the country. In India, a little bit less than 60%, et cetera, et cetera, you know, you see. So in China, for instance, it's, uh, it's uh, 45%. Uh, in the United States, a little bit more than 40%. So it's just gigantic. And of course, this raises a big question. Um, how do you want uh, to implement a carbon tax if you don't reduce this inequality? So in Europe, it's, uh, let's say, 33 32% uh, for the top five, top 1%. So it's just gigantic. And as you know, it's widening. So the question is how to reduce this and how to make it socially acceptable to ask everybody to make efforts in order to, um, to reduce our carbon footprint and our matter footprint on natural ecosystems. So yeah, you know, there was also this, this chart, which was very famous, or, uh, which is called the, the elephant graph, um, which has been originally published by the World Bank, essentially by Branko Milanovic, um, which says the following. So here you have, again, the income group in terms of percentiles. So here you have the top, 1% here, and here you have the share of real income growth that has accrued to this population um, in the past uh, 30, 36 years here in this graph. So this means that, you know, let's say the, the, the top 1% of the population at the world level, according to this graph, earned more than 50% of the real income growth in the last 30, 36, uh, 36 years. So we, we call this the elephant graph because as you see, it looks like an elephant. But then this measure has been redone by another team of researchers and they found this. It's not an elephant, it's the Loch Ness. In so far, um, the, the, the gap is even wider than what was thought by, by the World Banks. Because here, you, you, to a certain extent, you have good news. The World Bank was saying, you know, the middle class has been screwed up. The very wealthy people made a lot of money, but poor people also made some gains. So this was the rise of emerging countries. So what the, this alternative team has shown is that actually there was even not such a thing like a real rise, rise of emerging countries, that essentially everybody has been screwed up except for very wealthy people. So I think it's very important also to tell our, our beloved students that they, they have to take this into account in the way they want to organize their own professional life and they want to manage their, their company because just widening inequalities will make uh, the solution of the, the climate problem even worse, even more difficult. And I published a paper with a friend of mine, Mateusz Grasselli, showing that increasing inequalities, income inequalities, will drive our economies towards big, big problems in terms of deflation induced by debt. So nowadays we have a, a, a rise of inflation essentially due to the rising price and cost of energy and matter. But the main tendency of our Western, Western economies in the past 10 years was rather, was rather deflation. And I do believe 
you know, these kind of dynamics induced by the rise of inequalities is certainly very threatening. Uh, in so far, it makes it impossible to invest in new technologies, to invest in new green infrastructures. And this is the main topic of the last five minutes, which is how to find money to invest. So um, there is a beautiful book published by two friends of mine, Anna Grandjean and Julien Le Fournier, which makes the case of, of green finance and which just, you know, <clears throat> put forward the argument that I'm also defending for a long time now, which is probably most of what we call today green finance is not green. Um, and we definitely have to understand this, to have to understand how to have really green asset management funds, really green banks, so that they can fund uh, green infrastructures, because we need a lot of money for these green infrastructures. The idea for a number of economists, that's a, at least a figure uh, published by the, um, the new climate report, climate economy report, uh, two or three years ago, we need approximately 90 trillion of dollars, so 90,000 billions uh, by 2035 at the world level, in order to have some chance to remain below the two degree threshold at the end of this century or alternatively, but that's almost equivalent, in order to be uh, carbon neutral by 2050 at the world level. So 90 trillions, that's a lot of money. Um, and the question is, where are we going to find this money? And certainly, this is a question I would ask my students to think about, because this will also be part of the daily, you know, bread and butter uh, for their worries in the coming decades. So in this area, certainly, I think we should expose our students to the question of, of how to rewrite Basel III in order to have a green Basel IV, um, which, which provides the prudential framework within which our banks are working. I would ask the same question for international accounting standards, so the well-known IFRS. I would ask the same question for Solvency II for insurance companies. In other words, we are working within a framework, an accounting framework, which is completely at odds with the needs induced by the ecological challenges. And we definitely need to rewrite them in order to help our banking system, our insurance company system deal with the, the ecological challenge. Um, let me jump directly to two points that we have raised at the Institut Rousseau, which is, as you know, a French think tank of which I'm the, the president today, um, which was launched two years ago now. Um, last year, we have published a report about um, fossil fuel assets in the first 11 banks of the Eurozone. So the question we have uh, asked is, is um, looking at the balance sheets of these banks, what is the size of the assets which are directly linked to fossil fuels and whose market value will presumably be zero in case we decide to more morning to be serious in terms of ecological challenges and to ban um, uh, coal, uh, oil, and, and gas. So suppose tomorrow morning we decide that these three assets, uh, coal, oil, and gas, are stunning asset. What is the size of the loss that will be made by the first 11 banks in the Eurozone, including the first French champions, you know, the four champions in France, that is BNP Paribas, Société Générale, PP Sonatexis, and Crédit Agricole. Uh, the answer is um, 530 billion euros for the first 11 banks. And what is, what is even more uh, 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 frightening is that these fossil assets represent on average 95% of the equity of these banks, 95%, which means that uh, if we were bold and serious in terms of shifting towards renewable energies um, uh, and at least getting rid of fossil fuel energies to the morning, then all these banks would be bankrupt because a bank which, lost, which loses 95% of its equity is just bankrupt. So of course these banks know it because they're not stupid. And when I talk to CEOs of big banks, they acknowledge that they have made this calculus and they know it. And that's my belief is that this is one of the reasons why most big banks actually are not funding the ecological transition. And as you know, and this has been denounced by a number of NGOs, including Oxfam, a number of times, um, at least in France, for instance, to give just one figure, uh, out of 10 euros of um, funding of energy by French banks, seven euros are still targeted towards uh, fossil fuel energies, still today. So the reason for this reluctance of the banking system to fund 
non-fossil fuel energy, I believe, is essentially due to what the report published last year by the Institute Rousseau made clear. That is, these banks, they know that they will be bankrupt. Um, and this was already made, also made clear, even though in a more uh, euphemistic um, vocabulary, by um, Mark Carney in his famous uh, speech in 2015, September 2015, which is called today the tragedy of terrorism, um, where he said, well, you know, the, the, the financial system in the world will be exposed to three big risks induced by climate change and global warming. Uh, the first risk is the physical risks, that is the fact that capital will be destroyed by a number of extreme events. This is what I showed you know, earlier when I showed you uh, the map drawn by um, this one by Munich Ray. Um, that is, cap I mean, natural disasters are going to destroy capital. But this is also clear if you look at this map, um, because there is a lot of capital in big cities, or this map, et cetera, et cetera. So this is um, the physical risk. Um, and then Makane said, and he went on and said, there is a second risk, which is what he called the transition risk. At this time, back then, um, seven years ago, he said, well, you know, if we go too quickly, too rapidly, um, if we get rid too rapidly of fossil fuels, then a number of financial institutions will be in trouble. This was a gentle and polite way to say they will be bankrupt. So we made clear last year that they indeed, at least the first 11 big banks in the Eurozone will be bankrupt if we decide to uh, ban um, coal, oil and gas. And then Marconi back then in 2015 mentioned a third risk, which definitely uh, should be also mentioned to our students, which was the legal risk. The fact that a growing number of people, NGOs, companies, um, at least NGOs, let's say, will file sue, uh, will sue uh, countries and companies because they don't, um, they don't do their homework in terms of cleaning their, their activities and uh, implementing and putting into practice at least the Paris Agreement, for instance. And as you know, <coughs> one NGO in the Netherlands uh, was successful in doing this. And this is certainly not the last attempt uh, to do this. You, you are certainly aware of the L'Affaire du Siècle in France. So I would definitely also speak about these kind of questions um, and teach this to my students. Uh, the second point I want to mention is another report that we have published this year with L'Institut Rousseau, which is titled 2% for 2 degrees, which is the cost of the energy shift. Uh, at least in France. So this is kind of complementary to the beautiful work done by, by the SHIFT project. So what we have tried to do is not just, you know, to identify who is polluting and what is polluting uh, in France, but also how much it would cost to try to reach uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. So we relied heavily on the work done by, by the SHIFT project, but also uh, RTE, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we ended up with the conclusion that this would cost, and that's here, on average every year, 57 billion euros of additional cost of investment in order to reach uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. So you may disagree with us, um, and that's perfectly fine with me. What I would teach to my students in a business school would be that there are a number of people who try to figure out how much it would cost and who could pay and how we could fund this. Because definitely, whatever being the job of our students in the coming decades, they will have to face these questions. Um, so according to the Rousseau Institute, um, so this would cost 57 billion euros per year of additional cost, hence the title 2%, because that's roughly speaking 2% of our GDP today in France, 2% for two degrees, that is in order to remain below the two degree threshold at the end of this century. How would this be divided? Um, that's here. We computed, we estimated that this would cost a little bit more than 37, I mean, 35, uh, 35 billion euros for the public sector and, and something like 20 million euros for the private sector. So I'm not going to enter into all the details, but you will, you will find them in the report. And I do believe I would, you know, certainly spend one, one, a, a good amount of time uh, teaching this to my students and, and reflecting with them about this in order for them to understand what is at stakes in this kind of cost and where we could find the money to, to fund this additional infrastructure. And I will stop here. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Gail. Um, we have like a number of questions in the Q and R, and I invite uh, everybody who is attending the conference to uh, to to write them in the Q and R section. We have also uh, several panelists that could ask a directly question to you if they just want to switch on their camera and their mic. That would be great. Uh, just just to start, maybe you, you talked about it, but uh, in in terms of overall. Uh, functioning of the finance in, in it's it's a complete rupture with what what we are seeing with business as usual let's put it this way how would you like summarize the main things that should be uh, uh, taught to students uh, and and the main ruptures in in their education in business schools from the finance standpoint mm, i would certainly i would certainly tackle three points the first one would be to say as I mentioned, we have to change completely the framework within which a number of financial institutions are working. So this refers to the accounting uh, standards, you know, international uh, accounting standards, the so-called IFRS and IAS in the US. Um, I would also teach them how to change the, uh, what I call, what is called, you know, Basel III and Solvency II, both for banks and for uh, insurance companies. So this is one aspect. So change the framework within which we are working. And this also includes, of course, the so-called green accounting standards um, on which uh, people like uh, Richard in Dauphine uh, are working. So how do you include the ecological debt within the financial instruments uh, with which you can manage a company? So this is one aspect. The second aspect, certainly I would um, enter into the big debate about uh, money creation. Um, unfortunately, during decades, people have been taught a completely false theory about money. Um, there is a beautiful paper by Werner, a guy from Oxford, which he published, I think, two years ago, whose title is One Lost Century in Monetary Theory. And he tries to explain why during one century, we essentially have taught bullshit in terms of monetary theory. So, you know, many people would teach that um, uh, a bank cannot create money out of nothing that essentially a bank can create can give you a credit in, to, in case uh, the central bank is creating enough, enough of central bank money. Uh, and when you reach out to your banker and you ask for money because let's say you want to fund an investment in your company, then the bank can only do it if it has enough of central bank money. This theory is completely wrong, completely false. And uh, definitely we need to explain to our students what someone like Schumpeter knew perfectly at his time back then at the beginning of the 20th century, that is like a, that a bank, a private bank, creates money out of nothing, out of thin air. And that bank, that money, sorry, is created endogenously. That is, uh, it's not true that supply creates its demand. Bank, banks will create money only if there is a demand for credit. So, um, so this goes back to the, so, the, the very famous exchange equation MV equals PY or PT. So we need to re-explain to our students that this equation has been completely misunderstood during decades, et cetera, et cetera. So here there's a big chapter, which is um, you know, monetary theory. And the third one would certainly, I would try to explain why I did it very quickly earlier, uh, why uh, financial markets are inefficient. So that for instance, the modigliani miller theorem is completely wrong. The modigliani miller theorem tells you that um, for a company to raise money by increasing its equity or by uh, uh, going into debt, you know, the modigliani miller theorem will tell you this is a completely equivalent. That's one of the, you know, the first lecture in standard finance lectures, but this is completely wrong. Um, so there are a number of arguments in order to explain why this is not true. Uh, so I'm not going to give the lecture now, but I would certainly try to explain this to my students. Um, and, and more broadly, why financial markets are inefficient. So we cannot rely on, on financial prices to give us the right information. And then this circles back to, um, to international accounting standards, because what we have done in 2005 with the so-called IAS 39, so the 39th article of the International Accounting Standards is that we have plugged into the balance sheet of companies, financial prices. In so far, in as much we have said, we said that 
the accounting value of an asset owned by a company should be equal to the market price of this asset. So this is the so-called fair value theory, uh, which is also a complete nonsense because this would make sense only if financial markets were efficient, but they are not. And they are just, you know, um, haunted by big bubbles every second day, et cetera, et cetera. So I would explain all this, and this would certainly be the third chapter. That is, financial markets are intrinsically inefficient. They need to be regulated. I'm not saying that we should close financial markets, certainly not, but we should not dream of the invisible hand. The invisible hand is invisible because it doesn't exist. And this is completely orthodox, a neoclassical macroeconomic theory. Thank you, thank you. We'll, we'll move to other questions and uh, feel free also to ask questions in French if you are not comfortable in English, so no problem. I don't know if uh, Clarisse, Florent or Anne uh, would like to, to start or if we go to the, the Q&A question. Line. Yeah, maybe I'd like, uh, hello, uh, thank you for, for this presentation. I'd like to know how do your students react to all of what you say to them? Uh, do you manage to convince them? Or is there a really small part of them who are aware of it already and uh, who want to do something and oh. to move their habits? So I don't need to convince them of anything. They are more convinced than I am. So the point is to help them not being desperate and to find hope somewhere. So, so very quickly, they understand that we are in the same boat and we both try to just to save the planet. And, um, you know, the young generation has a complete, completely different mindset from our generation. So at least the students I meet probably have a bias in the students I'm meeting because those who still dream to, to go to Wall Street, probably they, not, they don't follow my lectures. Um, and what is the level of your students? Because I, I, I'm not student? sure, I, I don't not, have exactly the same opinion on the proportion of students who are really aware and want to do something. Okay. Well, these are master students. Um, okay. But, uh, but the younger they are, the more convinced they are. So, so if they were undergrad students, it would be even better. In, in so far, they would be even more aware of the problem. So, yeah. So maybe Clarice, you want to do to say something about that? Because um, you are one of the students and you know your, uh, your friends. Yes, uh, are you students, business students? Because at least among business students, I don't really see that many people that are interested in that subject. Oh, I see. You know, uh, well, my students come from everywhere in the university. So I should, I should ask them whether some of them come from the business curriculum, you know, um, maybe, maybe not. I, I have to check that through now. Is your course some, uh, one of the courses they have to choose? My, my lecture? No, it's, you know, yeah. I mean, in Georgetown is completely optional. They, they choose whatever they want to do. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, it seems to me maybe that's a self-enforcing process. That is, those students who are not interested in ecology, they might choose to go to a business school because they know they won't be bothered with this in a business school. Um, you know, so maybe in a business school, you don't find students who are interested in ecology because those who are interested in ecology, they don't go to a business school to begin with. I don't know. We should, we should check that, certainly. Yes, I think that's the case because... Um... Our school also is trying to um, make more ecological classes, and it's not well. I don't know exactly the statistics, but among my friends, it's not that popular. So I'm really okay. worried about that because some of them actually know the statistics you've shown us, not in detail, but they know that the situation is bad. But it's not pushing them to change. Okay. When, when we think about uh, the evolution it, in, it involves in terms of uh, curricula in business schools, uh, we see some obstacles. Um, like, for instance, the fact that uh, specifically in finance, but I think it's, it's also more general, um, like, uh, like business schools with the accreditation system, they tend to recruit uh, professors who uh, publish in uh, the biggest reviews. Sure. And, and these biggest reviews tend to have a very focused 
uh, approach of finance and economics, which is kind of uh, make it difficult to, to deal with uh, ecological issues, which are much more like cross-functional or cross uh, or transversal. And, and also there may be a, maybe some editorial line in these big reviews that make it more difficult to publish this kind of topics. What's your view about that? Is it truly an obstacle you see? Or? Definitely, yeah, yeah. This is one of the main big problems. That is, um, as you know, a prof can only, I mean, he has to publish or to perish, he or she. And, uh, and indeed, indeed, the top journals, both in economics and in finance, almost completely neglect, at least up to recently, almost completely neglected um, the climate change issue and more broadly, the ecological issue. So, so I remember I had a discussion with the head of the economics department at Sciences Po in 2018, because um, I was asking myself whether I, could, I would go there or not. You know? So and I asked him, so what is your viewpoint about ecology? And so in 2018, he said, oh, I don't have any viewpoint. We don't work on ecology. And I said, why, how come? You know, that's a big problem for a lot of people. The vast majority of humanity on earth and he said, well, you know, we publish only in the top 10 journals and they don't care about ecology. So we don't care about ecology. So, yeah. So then I, then I did not go to Sciences Po. I mean, you know, as long as they keep this viewpoint, they are just going to be irrelevant in a number of years. And once everybody realizes they are irrelevant, you know, the society will get rid of them. Maybe this is going to happen to a number of business schools if they don't, if they don't change their mind. Here at Georgetown, the business school has opened a master degree in ecology. So they have understood that that's the future. Yeah, and it's a trend we see in business schools. Uh, the thing we are working on uh, with, with this project, uh, with the shift, is also to see in, in what may, in to what extent the, uh, the challenge of uh, the, 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 the Earth planet limits is really integrated in, in the uh, in the, in the the teaching because uh, there are different ways to talk about uh, ecologies and sometimes it's a very uh, uh, thin layer of green on the business as usual uh, type of courses yeah. uh, and uh, my feeling is that for professors it's a very it's it's a huge ruptures and sometimes uh, it's difficult for them to it raises a lot of questions it brings them out of their area of comfort in a certain way and uh, it's a, Okay. Do, do you see some levers to 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 like to help this movement? Some uh, way to 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 help them move forward uh, uh, in these topics? Is are there things that? Uh... Oh yeah, they should they should watch Think of You and uh, <laughs> and watch uh, Jean Marc. Uh, you know. So yeah, I mean everything. I mean it depends completely upon the the personal trajectory of the prof. I mean some of them. They are in the 50s and they don't want to change anything. They just wait, you know, to be retired and they make money and they're happy with that. So you can breed, you can do very little with them. Some others still are curious and try to understand the world they are in and are ready to change a little bit their mind. You know, um, so I, I speak more with researchers and there are, there's a, a huge variety of researchers who are in, facing the same problem. Um, and so, for instance, I can give you an example of a very interesting guy. So I'm not going to give his name, but uh, he was working for the IMF, for the research department of the IMF. And uh, he was doing a very, very neoclassical work, you know, using standard models, which are complete bullshit. And, but he was trying to distort this model in order for them to say things they are not supposed to say, like energy is very important, climate change is a big mess, et cetera, et cetera. Then after a while, he was censored by the IMF. And he decided to leave because he didn't want to work as a researcher who is censored by his, his hierarchy. So he left the IMF and he ended up in the Central Bank of uh, England, the Bank of England, where he's doing a fantastic job. But he's still using the very standard neoclassical stupid models. And once I had a breakfast with him and I, I told him, well, how do you want to say something clever and relevant with a language which is completely wrong? And he said, you know, I'm too old to change the language now because I, I worked with this during 25 years. So I'm going to speak Chinese while I use French, you know, or you see what I mean, with French words. So, so he was in this very uncomfortable situation. I, and I guess he will 
stay in this situation until he retires. So you have indeed these kind of problems that people are facing. It's a transition phase. So, but I hope the next generation will not face this kind of problem. Marcian, maybe you want to uh, voice some of the questions yes, that were uh, written. Thank you. There's a question in the chat by Valentina Carbone, who acknowledges that uh, students need to be aware of their main grand challenges, and she acknowledges this importance. But her question is, how do you translate these issues into business, um, to business related knowledge, which is actionable and, uh, and able to discard business as usual behavior? Well, you know, um, so let me share my screen again uh, with you. What I showed you earlier, um, oops, uh, the map, the very first map with which I, I began everything, um, oops, this one. So a number of companies are very interested in that. So we have a partnership with Deloitte, the big consulting company, because Deloitte wants to be able to develop this type of model in order to understand that. Why? Because whatever being your business, if you are a manager at the international level, you want to know where people are going to, to starve and where people are going to migrate and where you can make business. Because obviously, once you see this, you know that you're not going to make a lot of business in Indonesia and it will be very, very hard in India, you see? So actually, I mean, the, the, the business application of this is quite straightforward, um, at least for people who understand that if they want to make money, they rather have to go to places or invest in places where they can really make it. Uh, because it will, it will not, it will just be impossible here. So if you are entering a value chain which relies heavily on Indonesia, then you should reflect twice before doing this, you see? So yeah, so, so I mean, for me, the application is quite straightforward. And the proof of that is that a number of private companies are very interested in this kind of, this kind of model. And if I may add something related to these questions, how can we talked about questioning uh, economic financial paradigms and how do you think professionals uh, working in companies can make the link between their practices on the one side and the questioning of economic paradigms on the other side? So my experience is that many managers don't believe what economists are saying. They know that economists are saying a lot of bullshit. They don't trust them. They don't even listen to them. Um, so it's not a hard, it's not a big deal to convince a, a manager of a private company that he should not listen to uh, to orthodox economists. The question for him is, um, where am I going to do business? And where, who are my customers? What is the next tenancy? So if you speak about you, you tell him, you know, you have a nexus where you need to have an access to energy, clean energy. You need to have an access to water because water is going to be scarce. You need to have an access to minerals. And for that purpose, you need to get rid of this kind of, you know, gadget and to invent a low tech industry. Um, and you need to have food for the people who work with you and for your customers. Then you have an excess of with four items. And that's, you know, so that's the, the secret of your business to more money. Then he or she is very interested in. And yet, and yet on some management sciences and management tools very well closely related to current economic paradigms. Well, yeah, sure, it's true. So I was mentioning, you know, the, the Modigli and Miller theorem. So you have crazy companies today which go into debt, so which borrow money with the right hand in order to fund dividends to their shareholders with the left hand, which is a complete nonsense from a management and accounting viewpoint. And I guess there are a number of people doing this because they still believe the money the immediate theorem. And they say, well, you know, debt and capital is the same, it's equivalent. Because I was taught, you know, at Stanford Business School that it's, it's the same, so it must be true. So indeed, indeed, to a certain extent, they rely to this kind of crazy theories. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not afraid by that because at the end of the day, there is a kind of pragmatism, which, at least that's my experience, which saves them. In other words, they are not as crazy as my beloved colleagues in economics, you know. Okay. Another question? Uh, 
Yes, there is another question from the audience. Uh, so it, the person asks, uh, while the evidence is overwhelming and the warning calls are many, how can we get higher education institutions to change their curriculum? I would like to ask specifically which narrative can be powerful, inspiring and unifying enough to drive deep and lasting change? Or, narr or will narrative full of facts? I did not understand the last Or sentence. will narratives full of facts? Full of threats? No, follow the facts. Sorry. Oh, follow the facts, oh, sorry. Um, okay, so that's, this is a big question. How to make desirable, uh, a sustainable path towards um, a, a zero carbon future? It seems to me the report that we have just published at the Institute Rousseau um, is part of the picture that in so far it gives figures, numbers, ideas, scenarios that you can discuss and which are very concrete. So for instance, do people accept to become vegetarian? That's a big question. We could ask who is vegetarian in the audience just now, right now, you know? Um, so these are very concrete questions and you can begin there and start there and say, well, don't you think it's a much more um, healthier future that we're going to build if most healthy adults become vegetarian? and we reduce the emissions of methane on earth. So, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to build this narrative, but it seems to me we have many pieces of this narrative already there. We need, we need people to bring them together in the way Jean-Marc is doing it, or I'm doing it, or Philippe Buix is doing it, et cetera, et cetera. So that's part of the job, definitely. But um, yeah, I don't know whether I'm answering the question, but. Otherwise, you know, I do believe the reason why we don't move is not, is not really the lack of narratives because we have them. It's really what I mentioned about the banks. You know, banks are everywhere. We need money everywhere and we need a, a huge amount of money in order to fund green infrastructures. As long as many bankers and big banks will be convinced that the ecological transition is their enemy because it will kill their business, they will just refuse to fund it. And as soon as you will have a private company saying, well, I would like to, to make something great in this direction, they will just refuse to fund it. Let me just give you an example. A friend of mine <clears throat> in Nantes <clears throat> discovered a way to build uh, organic photovoltaic, which, which uses almost no mineral and which sets you free from the minerals you have to import from China. So that's a gigantic invention. That's just fantastic. But he's at pain in finding a few dozens of millions of euros in order to industrialize this idea. Why? Just because the banking system doesn't want to fund it. And it's not just, you know, because they are risk adverse and they don't know the return of the investment, blah, blah, all this. It's also deeply because they don't want to fund the ecological transition. So we need to have a collective discernment about how to not convince, but to force our banks to change the business model, you know? So one way to do it without implementing the revolution is um, to find a way to get rid of these fossil assets, which are still on the balance sheet of these banks in the same way we did it for the subprime assets. So what we suggest, what we suggested last year in the, in the report of the Institute Rousseau was to say, well, you know, actually there are only three ways to get rid of that. One, which is you wait for the banks to be bankrupt which is not a good idea. Second, you do what we did in 2009 after the subprime crisis. That is, you built a bad bank, you know, in French, a Banque de Défaisance, which is a, a state-owned bank, which is going to buy, to purchase, to purchase these fossil assets from the private banks, and which is going to make the loss. So the private banks are free. They get money instead of these brown assets. The bad bank loses money and keeps the brown assets and everybody should be satisfied. The unique problem I have with this quote unquote solution is that being state owned, the bad bank will have a lot of debt and this debt will be charged on the balance sheet of the state. So this will increase public debt, which means at the end of the day, you and me, we are going to pay for that, the taxpayers. And so once again, it will be the taxpayer who is going to pay for the mistakes made by the banks, which I don't believe is a good solution. So there is a third option, which is the option I'm pushing, which is to say, you know, we have one bank which can make losses without going bankrupt. 
which is the central bank, the ECB. So the ECB could become a bad bank, could buy purchase these assets from the private banks, you know, with a, a reduction of the price so that the banks would feel the pain, you know, without going bankrupt. And the ECB would then keep these assets on its balance sheet. The ECB would make the loss. But you know, the equity of the ECB is ridiculously small, 80 million euros, which is nothing. So it's not the equity of the ECB, which is uh, allowing the ECB to work. It's just because it's a central bank. So when I say this, a number of orthodox economists uh, immediately reply, oh, Giraud doesn't know what he's talking about, et cetera, et cetera. You cannot think about it making, I mean, letting the ECB make, make losses. And fortunately, there was a report published by the um, uh, BIS, the Bank of International Settlement in Basel, a beautiful small city in Switzerland. And the BIS is just the central bank of central banks. So if there is someone who knows what a central bank is, I guess these are the people in the, in the BIS. And they published a report saying, you know, a central bank can lose entirely its equity and still operate as a central bank. The central bank does not need equity to operate and to create money. So the ECB could lose the entirety of its equity without going bankrupt and still operating as an ECB, as the central bank of Europe, you know, of the Eurozone. So this would be, this is my best choice because if we were to do this, nobody would lose one penny. And then we would have solved the problem of the banks and we would tell the banks. So we, we put into practice the surgery operation, which consists in getting rid of these fossil assets in your balance sheet. But then from today on, you will stop completely funding brown projects, you see? So you make it conditional. So it's a way to save the banks and to ask them now, tomorrow morning, you're going to become serious and you are going to fund only uh, green projects, you see? We could do this. Um, we would have to explain it. We would, have, we would have to do it in a coordinated way at the Eurozone level. But this would be a fantastic way to relaunch the European project and to say, well, we need a new banking system for the future. We are going to, to implement a huge surgery operation to save our banks in order to be able to fund the, you know, the few trillions that we need in order to, to fund green infrastructures. And my guess is that once we have done it, you know, everybody is in favor of the ecological transition, maybe except for Total, you know, but who can save Total? But once the banks are ready, I'm sure they will find curricula in business schools where we teach our students how to make the transition because they will be in favor of it. So in your opinion, uh, which finance and economical professions are likely to evolve the most? And are there cer certain professions that would disappear in the near future if there is a, oh, a trajectory yeah, to respect? Yes, yeah, certainly a huge part of, um, of people working on financial markets. We will have a big crash sooner or later because we are now in a big bubble. Um, the bubble, the financial bubble, both in Wall Street and in, in, in London, in the city, is essentially fed by the quantitative easing of central banks, because we no longer have the income stemming from the real economy of China. You know that up until 2009, approximately, China was reinvesting his, its commercial surplus in the financial sphere of London and, and Wall Street. Uh, but since 2010, having understood that financial markets are completely inefficient and non-reliable and very dangerous. China stopped doing this. So the financial sphere today is no longer fed by this income stemming from the real, real economy. So investors, in order to take advantage of the bubble have to go into debt. So there is a huge amount of private debt on the shoulders of private investors on financial markets. If the economy doesn't grow, they will not be able to have real income from the real economy to pay back the debt, so they will have to sell their assets sooner or later. So this is called the Minsky moment. The Minsky moment will come. I don't know when, nobody knows when, and nobody knows where, but it's sure it will come. So when it comes, we will have a big crash. We are even less prepared to a big crash today than we were in 2008. The European Banking Union does not protect our banks. I published a report in 2015 for the European Parliament showing that the European uh, Banking Union does not protect our banks. So if we have a big crash, 
many banks will go bankrupt and we will probably stop relying on, on financial markets to feed our dreams. So, yeah. So I would certainly, if I was a young professional today, I would certainly not go on financial markets. And I, I'm saying this because I did it when I was uh, 29 years old. I, I worked as a consultant for private banks and financial markets. So I did mathematics, you know, for traders um, in order to compute the price of, um, of CDO, collateralized debt obligations, these massive destruction weapons, which exploded in 2008. So, so I did it, and I would certainly not recommend to do it today. We have uh, another question related to well, more education. Yeah. Um, since classical economy is still everywhere, how to educate the students to the inefficiency of the classical economy and make them understand its limits? Oh, there are a number of beautiful textbooks which explain this. Um, and, and actually the inefficiency of market is part of classical economy. The point is that it is not taught. Um, you know, um, most, um, most economists, I mean, neoclassical economists and standard finance people, they don't know their theory. They don't know their own theory. I'll give you an example. Um, there is a beautiful book on, on general economic theory, which is written by a German economist. Uh, which has two volumes. So the first band is the very, very, very narrow-minded situation where markets are indeed efficient. So markets are complete, blah, blah, blah. The second band deals with the much more complicated real case where markets are incomplete and therefore inefficient. Most of my colleagues, they teach the first band, they never teach the second band. And why? They say, oh, you know, the second band is very complicated. It's hard for our students. They already have a hard time understanding the first band, the first volume. So I never have time to go into the second volume. And then I say, and why don't you start with the second volume to begin with, you know? So, so you know, if they were just a little bit more courageous and actually stronger in their own theory, they would teach that markets are inefficient. And I can, I can give a number of references for that if someone is interested in it. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. I did it, you know, for years, decades. Okay. Um, I'd like to know, uh, in your opinion, what are the top five competencies that we, uh, that the um, new managers uh, must have, must get to, to get rid of uh, the business, business as usual? Oh, that's a good question. Let me think about it. The top five competencies. Wow. Um... Well, you know, there are a number of competencies that every manager needs. Certainly what we um, Jesuits in Georgetown, we would call this the Cura Personalist. That's a Latin word. I'm going to write it here. You can, see, you can read it. So it's a way yeah. to say, we have to take care of the person. So for instance, I'm probably a bad manager. You know, I don't pretend anything. But what I try to do with my team here is to take care of everybody, um, not just as a, as a colleague, but also as a human being. Uh, if someone has a problem as a, as a professional, very often it means that this someone has a, pro has a personal problem. So as a manager, I try to understand it without, of course, trying to enter into the private life of anybody. But, you know, so the Cura Personalis, um, I do believe it's very important for managers, definitely. Um, and that's a really Jesuit uh, viewpoint. I would say this, but this is not definitely, I mean, this is not uniquely related to, to the climate change issues. Actually, it's, we could say that integral ecology, that is ecology consists also in taking care of the person, of people. Um, so this is one thing. The second thing, um, yeah, certainly, yeah, certainly, I would ask a manager to listen to the young generation. Uh, uh, so very often, for instance, I meet colleagues who tell me, oh, you know, I never speak about climate with my kids at home because then they yell at me and, they, and I'm tried and, and I'm condemned because I've messed up everything, you know? So, so I would tell a manager, you have, to, you have to talk with your kids. 
And if they have something to tell you about you eating too much meat and driving your SUV and et cetera, et cetera, you have to listen to them because actually they are right. So I would certainly tell this to him or her. Um, Voila. Well, then there, there, is, there are a number of things I would advise this manager to do, but it's not a competence, you know. Um, yeah, probably I would say, you know, you have to be very good both in accounting and in economics in order to be free from it. I, I do believe there are a number of people who are afraid to think out of the box because they are unsure about the box. They don't know it very good. And so, you know, um, if you're not a good skier, you're afraid to try to do something completely crazy by skiing, you know? If you're a very good skier, you know, you know you can make it, so you can try something completely new, you know? So I guess I would, I would certainly say you have to be very good in your own you know, classical competencies in order to be free and to be bold enough to do something completely new and innovative. Um, I would also certainly advise this, this person to be aware of, of a narcissistic perversion. Um, I say this because, you know, there was a big scandal in California a couple of months ago about a woman, very cute, very clever. Um, she was coming from Stanford, I guess, and she launched a company about a very innovative process. And and she, she became a billionaire before, before her 30s. So she was very, very successful. She became an iconic woman. Um, and then we discovered that she had nothing in her company. So no innovation, no innovative process. Everything was a lie from the beginning. And uh, so it was very embarrassing for everybody because some people, so she had married one of the biggest investors of her company. Uh, so. <laughs> So, and that's an example of, you have a number of people who are really completely mad because they are so obsessed by their own narcissistic perversion that they are ready to invent incredible stories in order to, to make money, to be successful, etc., etc. So I do believe, and, and the more chaotic the world becomes, the more successful and numerous these people become. Also, because I do believe social media are feeding narcissism. So we are, I mean, I cannot say narcissistic people are more and more widespread, but there is a risk of that, certainly. I can, re I remember that, you know, 20 years ago when I was working, as I said, as a consultant for banks, I was sent once to um, a bank in New York, which had hired um, a, a trader, um, Chinese American trader who pretend to, pretended back then to have a software which makes millions um, automatically. So the bank had made the big mistake to believe that, to hire this trader with a very high salary. And after I think one year, he was losing a lot of money. But each time he was asked, so what about your software? He said, well, wait, 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 wait. It will come. It will be gigantic just next month, you know? So they asked me to go there and to talk with him and to investigate his software. So I spent one week in the bank and he would never accept to show me anything. Probably he didn't even have a software, nothing. It was just, you know, a lie like this woman in California. So this was 22 years ago, 21 years ago. Um, these kind of people are very dangerous for business. And as the world becomes more chaotic, more and more people might be tempted to play this kind of game. Um, so I would certainly advise my manager, be careful um, and, and not, not to be naive with this kind of people, uh, because this might be very, very detrimental to the, the company, for the company. Thank you. I, I have also a question. A certain number of professors I've been talking to are uh, viewing their discipline as being neutral in a certain way, considering that they're like teaching tools which doesn't have any political dimension. And 
while we were talking with the, the task force about uh, the different competency uh, uh, to, 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 to put in the, in, in the framework, uh, we really insisted on, on the aspect uh, that uh, there, there is a lot of politics in the tools that are taught in business schools. Mm. Uh, wh what, what argument will you do use to help uh, people to understand uh, the extent of the, the political dimension of their discipline, uh, even though they consider they are like perfectly neutral and they don't want to influence their students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's completely. Yeah, of course it's completely wrong. I mean, I would. I don't know. I would give one example, which is um, I had this discussion once a couple of two or three years ago in a panel, a panel discussion about uh, public debts in, in Europe. And I was warning, warning everybody saying, you know, Italy is going to be, to be in trouble. And now Italy is in trouble, as you know, with a public debt, which is above 160% of its GDP. So I was saying, you know, this, is, this will become a problem. Um, and Italy is not Greece. So you will not be able to inflict to Italy what has been inflicted to Greece between 2010 and 2015. So if you try to put into practice such, uh, such a nightmare, as the one that has been experienced by Greece uh, back then, then Italy will probably leave the Eurozone. I was saying this. And then there was a guy coming, um, who was not even a financial guy, but a philosopher uh, from Zurich, Switzerland. He came and he said, fortunately, financial markets are going to teach to Italy how to deal and to manage its budget. You know, so the very idea that a country in the eurozone has to borrow money on financial markets in order to fund its public policy gives financial markets a political power which is to dictate to a country a sovereign country a democratic country whether this country can do this or that you know you want to spend money in order to increase the minimum wage we are not going to fund your public debt you want to spend money in order to make wealthy people even wealthier we are going to fund your public debt so, so financial markets are highly political and highly anti-democratic. Why are they anti-democratic? Because, I mean, it seems to me the kernel of democracy is the fact that when you elect someone, you are in a small room in the shadow and nobody can see what you do. Nobody can see which name you put in the envelope, you know? So maybe you elected, you did not, you did not choose the guy who has been elected by the majority of voters. But nobody, nobody knows. So you cannot be uh, punished because of your vote. So on financial markets, everything is transparent. If I vote for a company, in so far I'm buying a share of this company, and if the market decide that this company is worth nothing, I will be punished. So the real, the very functioning of financial markets is not democratic, because you cannot express your opinion in such a way that you are not punished if the market believe, believe you are wrong. So the unique thing you can do is to anticipate what the markets will believe to be true and to yell in the direction of the market. You know, that's very well known, that the sunspot problem. You cannot be right against the market. So that's the anti-democratic aspect of financial markets. So now, if I'm teaching finance in a business school and I'm saying, you know, markets are efficient. And, um, and by the way, um, you know, um, banks don't create money and only the central bank can create money. And so the fact that we have given up the money uh, creation, the power of money creation from the hands of states so that the states have to borrow money on financial markets, that's a good thing. Like this philosopher, then I'm, I'm doing politics. That's entirely political. There is no such thing as a neutral finance theory. It doesn't exist. I have read the book by uh, uh, Alain Grandjean and uh, Julien Fournier. I, I hope I'm not wrong with the, the names. I know they, they are uh, quite skeptical about their uh, power, uh, not least because of uh, their in interpretation of the financial duty. But don't you see a potential in, in shareholder engagement, engagement, which is uh, fast evolving, and some major players are stepping in, asking for change. Maybe change is not going fast enough, but we we can cite some examples and and some funds, and some, including major funds, are becoming more activists. 
so don't, what what do you what is your take on on, on this? Well, my take on this is that it's fantastic. Indeed, there are a number of people who try really to move in the good direction. The main problem is the one I was alluding to with the the report of Institut Rousseau last year. And if if you are working in a big asset management fund which has a lot of fossil fuel related assets, you will be very tempted to do some greenwashing. Why? Because you know, otherwise you are just killing your fund. If you're working in a new fund, brand new, you know, less than 10 years old fund, which doesn't have the legacy of the past and which doesn't have fossil fuel assets in its balance sheet, then that's fine and you can do it. So there are a number of banks which are really trying to do a fantastic job. Let me just mention one example, which is Triodos, Triodos which is a, a, um, a bank from Netherlands, which is a really ecological bank, which uh, funds only really green projects where the, the scale of wages inside the bank is, uh, is one to five, one to five in the bank, you know, in BNP it's one to 1000, in Triodos it's one to five, and which has something like 20% of its balance sheet in equity, BNP by is 3%. Uh, so Triodos is for me a fantastic example. Why? Because it's brand new. So, so if you want to work in a bank, go to Triodos and you will do a fantastic job, definitely. Banks, as well as uh, institutional investors who have yeah, yeah. invested yeah. in uh, brown uh, assets and interests in, in uh, 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 advocating for a transition away from fossil fuels and, and to, uh, to you know, to push companies to to uh, uh, act faster on their uh, transition and their uh, I mean because they will end up anyway with those assets and if they do not if the policies of the companies do not change then the but there is a short window during which maybe there is some time to to, to disinvest or to change the strategy and, and uh, yeah so there are not so many funds which are divesting some of them a little bit many of them say claim we are divesting or we are going to divest you know it's like the russian gas everybody says we don't want to buy russian gas but everybody is still purchasing russian gas today in europe so uh, there is an interesting question also in, in the discussion, uh, and uh, I would be curious to hear your answer to that. Uh, how to integrate ecological value in prices? And I would add, is it really the way to do it? I mean, uh, yeah, it's not. It's not a way. I mean, we we do have this kind of question. If you want to put a social social value of carbon to carbon, um, so if the state has to invest in a big infrastructure. Uh, project, then you need to be able to compute the return on investment, even for the state, for the next 30 years, and then implicitly you give a price to carbon, In so far you give a value to the fact that you're going to reduce uh, carbon emissions. So there implicitly you give a price to it, but it's not a price given by the market, it's a price given in a conversation between smart people who want the thing to happen. Same story, for instance, in South Africa. South Africa today is uh, implementing an extraordinary uh, debt swap for climate. That is, in South Africa, maybe you're not aware of that, the main state-owned power utility called ESCOM is essentially bankrupt. And ESCOM has uh, millions of rands of debt, which it cannot pay, it cannot reimburse. And ESCOM made its business essentially out of coal mines. So investors have understood that, I mean, creditors of ESCOM have understood that ESCOM will never pay back its debt. So they are negotiating now a haircut of the debt in exchange for ESCOM to use money to invest in green energy. So this is called a swap. You are making a swap between the debt. So you are you know, giving up part of the debt in exchange for the company to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. And then by doing so, implicitly you give a price to carbon, you see? Um, so, so we do these kind of things and this is very important and useful, um, but this is not a market. So I would certainly not ask, how can we have introduced, I mean, include 
climate change into market prices because this cannot happen. Markets cannot take this into account, not in a clever way uh, because they are inefficient, but we can do it in a negotiation. We are human beings who can talk and negotiate. Question about uh, the way you, the, your way of teaching. Uh, earlier, you said that you tried to give hope to your students instead of yeah. trying to convince them. Yeah. Uh, There's a question about how do you, how do you create hope? How do you foster hope? And how, and maybe I should add, uh, how do you deal with eco anxiety of your students, and how do you deal with helping them um, getting into action? Well, um, that's a good question. Um, so I don't have any magic answer, but I try to talk with them about everything that is going in the good direction, the right direction. So just the example I gave to you about the, the swap uh, for climate in South Africa, for me, it's a big, big sign of hope because if you can do it at a national level for South Africa, which is deeply uh, dependent upon coal mines, then virtually we can do it for everything. We can do it in Europe. So, you know, I advocated for a long time ago already in 2013, the idea that we could cancel part of the public debt of uh, Eurozone countries, which is held by the ECB and its balance sheet. And the ECB could cancel part of this debt in exchange for each country to invest publicly in green infrastructures. So this would be a swap, a debt swap for climate at the European level. So then I, then I tried to explain to my students, you know, we can do it. It's not impossible. I mean, it's much easier to do this than to change the first two laws of thermodynamics, which are going to, to, you know, to destroy the planet. So yeah, and then I try to reflect with them on a number of concrete situations on the ground, on the field, <coughs> where we can make things. I give, give you an example. Um, we are working on a project in Mongolia because in Mongolia you have the ZUD. So I don't know whether my pronunciation is correct, but so ZUD, ZUD, I don't know. So which is the, the, the consequence of global warming. So the summer is hot and dry and the winter is very cold and dry. The consequence of that is that cows are, are just dying, starving. So nomadic people cannot remain nomads. So they have to settle down and to find another way to survive. And most of them are settling down in the suburb of Ulaanbaatar and they, are just, they just get slummified because there is nothing for them. So it's a nightmare. So the, the, the Mongolian government asked us to help them uh, figure out how to launch a network of organic farms where the nomadic people could settle down and work as farmers. And then this raises the question, which is how to, to implement the, the, the organic farms? Because as you probably know, I mean, um, the desertification process of Mongolia is, is, is uh, really growing really rapidly. So you have the Gobi Desert, which is growing. So the question is, where are they going to find water? So, and you know, I'm not an expert in water. I told you earlier that water is going to be a problem, but fortunately um, there is a French engineer, Alain Gachet, who developed a technique in order to find water uh, in the soil, you know, up to minus 400 meters below the surface of the soil. So groundwater. So he knows how to do this with satellite images and uh, radar and all these kind of things. So we are trying to work with him in order to have a mapping of groundwater in, in Mongolia, below the desert. And he's full of hope that there is a lot of water over there. Why? Because of the proximity of Himalaya, the Himalaya you know, mountains. So his idea is that most probably for centuries and centuries, there is water trickling down from the mountains below, I mean, within the mountain, in the soil, you know, in the rocks and et cetera, and, and going down to, to Mongolia. And if this is true, then actually they have plenty of water, but they don't know it. So the hope is that we will figure out where the water is, groundwater is, we will help the Mongolian government, uh, you know, uh, launching its uh, network of organic farms and nomadic people will be happy. So that's a big positive story. So you had a smile, I'm, I'm happy. Thank you. <laughs> Um, uh, another question that oh, might sorry, be somehow. Yeah, sorry, I did not answer the question of yes. eco anxiety. Um, eco anxiety, yeah, it's, it's 
more and more frequent in the young generation. Um, not very much in my generation, but in the young generation for sure. So I have to deal with it every second week. And then, you know, you sit down and you talk with your student and you try to help him, her or her understand that, well, you know, life is beautiful at the same way, at the same time, and that we are, we are all on the same boat. I don't have any magic solution, you know, but being, that's the core of personalis. So accompanying people is the best way to tell them, you know, I know it's, it's hard, but it's also hard for me. So we are going to do it together. Thank you. There was also a question about uh, whether um, you thought that business students, business school students should also learn some biology or earth sciences who have more knowledge about the living and about ecological issues. Um, I guess I can give a first answer, which is yes, business school students need to have this, um, some basics of biology or earth sciences to deal with these issues. But maybe my question would be how much, in your opinion, do they need to master these issues? This, this, is, this is a complicated question. I definitely agree with you that everybody, every student, whatever being his or her speciality, be it a lawyer or a business school student, should learn a little bit of biology and physics in order to understand what it takes. Um, now, how much this, I don't know. I mean, it depends completely. You definitely, I mean, they definitely don't need to learn part of physics, which is irrelevant for climate, like quantum mechanics. Don't, they don't need that. They don't need to understand the question of relativity and gravity theory, super string theory, you know. So I would focus on certainly um, thermodynamics, I would focus on a number of physics of, of materials that is needed um, and the physics that is in, embedded in climate uh, science. So this certainly, um, so there are textbooks about the physics of climate. Certainly I would try to cover a few chapters there and a few chapters in ecology uh, and biology applied to ecology. Yeah. I guess it, it's a little bit in, in the same uh, related to the question of Vincian, it's uh, like we're talking about a, a cross-disciplinary uh, approach introducing natural sciences in business schools. But already when we look at business school, we have like already several disciplines uh, working side by side without talking much together and yeah. with, uh, I'd say, epistemological approach of, uh, of the scientific basis, which are quite different. So how to, to bridge these, these disciplines together already within business schools? What's your take about that? that that's a good question. Um, so first of all, we have to understand where this problem comes from. The fact that everybody works in silo. Again, this goes back to your previous question, which is the fact that everybody has to publish or perish. And if you want to publish, I mean, there is no such thing as a top journal, which is really interdisciplinary. So, so people have to focus on the discipline and the less they try to be really interdisciplinary, the more successful they might be in terms of publications. So there is certainly something to be done at the level of academic publications to change this. Uh, on the other hand, you can also imagine that people give lectures with two voice. I mean, the old fashioned idea that a lecture is given by one prof could be changed. And you could ask that within the same lecture, there is both one guy who comes from biology and the other guy who comes from finance, you know, or I don't know, thermodynamics and economics, these kind of things. So I do this. Um, I used to give a lecture with a friend of mine who is teaching at Stellenbosch University in South Africa in a beautiful place, which is the Sustainability Institute, which is now called the Center for Sustainability Transitions, which is an ecological campus within an eco village. So that's just heaven on earth. And uh, so he's a political scientist. And as you know, I'm more, I'm more like an economist. So we teach with two voices and we are completely complementary. So, so the gap is not as large as a biologist and a finance guy, but you know, we could try to go in this direction. And then this would force the colleagues to talk together. Um, and if they disagree because they have completely different epistemological backgrounds, then that's even better because then they will be forced to talk together, you know? One minute before seven. So thank you very much, Gail. Thank you very much to everybody. 
uh, that was uh, super interesting as always i'd say uh, and uh, i hope uh, we'll have a chance to have you on our expert committee and uh, mm -hmm. to discuss again i know you are very busy but thank you very much to have taken time to talk to us and thank you to all the people who attended this discussion and uh, asked questions and interacted don't forget to put your name in the in the Google uh, form that uh, Vincent posted on, on the discussion to make sure you get uh, informed on the next uh, expert hearings and the next uh, videos we are going to put online. Thank you very much to all. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.